Thank you all so much for joining the Adirondack Land Trust this evening and our special guest, Scott Widensall. My name is Derek Rogers. I'm the stewardship manager at the Adirondack Land Trust. And I want to give a special shout out and thanks to tonight's program sponsors, Birds and Beans and Black Rooster Maple. Um, some of you may have already heard of these companies, but Birds and Beans is your bird-friendly coffee company. All of their coffee is organic, fair trade, and bird-friendly certified. To learn more about the importance of their mission and to shop their wonderful coffee products, please visit birdsandbeanscoffee.com. You can also find Birds and Beans locally at the Plattsburgh Food Co-op. And Black Rooster Maple is a first-generation family maple sugaring farm run by Christy, Kirk, and Riley Basarab. Their roadside shop is located in Keene, New York, just up the road from the Adirondack Land Trust office. They have a variety of incredible products, which can also be browsed on their website at blackrooster.com. And you could also find Birds and Beans and Black Rooster Maple on our website under the Business and Community Partners tab at adirondacklandtrust.org. So thanks so much for sponsoring this. It's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Scott Widensall. Scott has written more than 30 books, including his widely acclaimed Living on the Wind, Across the Hemisphere with Migratory Birds, which was a finalist for the 2000 Pulitzer Prize, and A World on the Wing, The Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds, a New York Times bestseller. In addition to writing about wildlife, Scott is an active field researcher whose work focuses on bird migration. He is a co-director of Project OwlNet, and for more than 25 years, he has directed a major effort to study the movements of northern saw wet owls, one of the smallest and least understood raptors in North America. More recently, Scott co-founded Project Snowstorm, which uses cutting-edge tracking technology to study snowy owls. Scott lectures widely on conservation and nature, and we at the Adirondack Land Trust, including some of the folks who joined us tonight, we're fortunate enough to hear Scott and illustrator Nancy Lane speak about their wonderful collaboration that resulted in one of my favorite children's books, A Warbler's Journey. And we're excited to welcome Scott back for another virtual program. So Scott, thank you again so much for joining us this evening and the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Derek. It is always a pleasure to do anything with the Adirondack Land Trust. Uh, it's an organization I really believe in. You're doing fantastic work in the Adirondacks. Um, I'm coming to you this evening, actually, from um, southern New Hampshire. Um, uh, it's not a bad place to be, uh, but it's not the Adirondacks, I have to say. Um, but uh, it's I'm here to talk about snowy owls. And it's kind of odd because this, as you gathered from some of the things that uh, that Derek said, this has been a pretty slow winter so far for snowy owls. But, you know, we're finally going to get a blast of uh, maybe some Arctic winter weather up to the north of us in the next couple of weeks. And hopefully that'll bring some more of these birds um, further south. But I want to tell you the story this evening of um, a completely accidental, um, utterly unplanned, but what has proven to be highly successful um, research project focusing on snow owls uh, that started 10 years ago this year in the, in the fall, in the, the winter of 2013-2014. So I, I've been messing around with birds kind of all my life. I grew up in the mountains of, of eastern Pennsylvania, not far from Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Some of you probably know Hawk Mountain is the world's first sanctuary for birds of prey. Got hooked on raptors at a very early age. Um, got my start in field research, um, trapping and banding migrating raptors. This is a Swainson's hawk down in the borderlands of Texas. But, um, but as Derek said, for the last, well, at this point, 27 years, um, I've been involved with studying northern sawwood owls. And I think if you'd asked me any time through most of those years, what my favorite bird was, if you put a gun to my head and made me take a choice, it would probably be the northern solid owl, because my God, look at that face. That is just a cosmically cute little bird. And over the years, working through an organization in central Pennsylvania called the Ned Smith Center for Nature and Art, we've banded about 13,000 of these birds in migration. And frankly, each, each new one I catch is just as exciting as the first one. But then about 10 years ago, my life took a turn and I got, I sort of fell under the spell of one of the most charismatic wild animals on earth. I mean, look at that bird. That is one big, sexy bird of prey. And the story of how I got enmeshed in snowy owl research when I wasn't intending to do so at all um, goes back, as I say, to the winter of 2013, 2014. So this is, this is an eBird map. Most of you are familiar with eBird. If you're not, it's the, the world's largest wildlife observational database. And this is a, a typical distribution of snowy owls in kind of a typical winter 
in the Northeast and Great, and Great Lakes. This was January of 2013. And you've got a couple hundred snowy owls scattered around the Great Lakes um, in the Ottawa and St. Lawrence River Valleys in Southern Canada, and then down um, through New England um, as far south uh, that winter as, as Long Island. That's a typical winter in January of 2013. This is December of 2013, which was about as far from a typical winter as it was possible to imagine. This was the biggest invasion of snowy owls into the east and, and central North America since at least the winter of 1926, 1927, and perhaps as far back as the 1890s. And when this happened, when this wall of white birds came flooding out of um, Canada in late November and early December 2013, it, for a while there, you couldn't turn on the television or radio or pick up a newspaper or magazine with, without reading or hearing something about snowy owls. And the story went something like this, that snowy owls live way up in the Arctic, where they feed mostly on small mammals like lemmings. And lemming populations rise and fall. And when the lemming population crashes, these owls have nothing to eat. And so these starving, hungry owls are forced south by, by starvation to wander this alien southern landscape where most of them are probably going to die. And you heard that from a lot of people who should have known better, including a lot of professional ornithologists, because unfortunately, just about everything in that story was completely wrong. It was not hunger and privation that provoked this enormous influx of snowy owls, but actually abundance and plenty. The previous summer, in May, June, July, and August of 2013, in northern Quebec, up in the Ungava Peninsula, Lemming populations, which rise and fall on a roughly four-year cycle in many parts of the Arctic, reached historic highs in that part of northern Quebec. And the snowy owls, we don't really know how they do this, but they somehow sense where these, where these lemmings are in number, and they gathered in large numbers in northern Quebec and started having babies. And this is a photograph of a <clears throat> snowy owl nest from that summer up in northern Quebec, there are, as you can see, four or five eggs and baby snowy owls in that nest surrounded by, and feel free to count, 78 dead lemmings and voles. The, the, they, the eggs haven't even hatched yet. And this guy is, this male owl is just like bringing in more prey than they can possibly eat. And, you know, I can hear the perhaps the women in the audience going, oh God, yes, men. Um, but there's actually a rhyme to, the, to this male owl's reason. What he's doing is he's showing his mate that like, baby, there's no need to stop at five. Just keep those babies coming. And in fact, that summer, because of this extraordinary abundance of food, you had a large number of snowy owls nesting there that produced a very large number of chicks. A, a more typical snowy owl clutch might be two or three chicks. Many nests that summer in the Ungava Peninsula were six, seven, eight, in some cases, nine babies. And there was enough food that almost all of those babies survived. And it was mostly those young owls flying south the next winter on their first migration that provoked that enormous mega eruption that we saw in the winter of 2013, 2014. Well, here in the United States, we got the first intimation of what was happening um, from bird watchers up in Newfoundland um, around Thanksgiving of 2013. Um, for example, it's a fellow named Bruce McTavish, who's a, a, a very well-known birder in Newfoundland, who reported seeing 300 snowy owls in one place at the southeastern tip of, of Newfoundland near, near uh, Cape Race. And then in early December, those birds started pouring south across the border and bird watchers in the U.S. noticed immediately. And I got a call on December 7th of, two, of uh, 2013 from my good friend here, Dave Brinker. Dave is a, a biologist with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. He and I have been working on solid owl and other owl research projects for more than 20 years. And Dave called me up and said, listen, none of us are going to live long enough to see something like this again. This is literally a once in a lifetime opportunity. We ought to just drop everything else we're doing and try to take advantage of this situation, take advantage of this phenomenon to get as much information and as much data as we can. And we were thinking kind of along the lines of encouraging other owl banders to make an effort to, to target snowy owls, to trap them and ban them, because actually there've been relatively few snowy owls banded in the United States over the preceding decades. But then a couple of things started happening in a hurry. Only a couple of hours after Dave called me, 
I got a call from an old friend of mine, Andy McGann, who worked for a company in, um, uh, it's now based in New, New Jersey called Cellular Tracking Technologies. And CTT makes transmitters that go on the backs of golden eagles and bald eagles and other large raptors. And Andy called me up and said, he's one of my former research interns. He said, listen, we've got a couple of transmitters sitting here on the shelf that we built for somebody else, but we would love to get these on snowy owls. And if you can just cover our costs on these things, we we will we'll provide them to you, and we can get some owls. We can get some owls tagged, which we thought was a fantastic idea. So we called my good friend Norman Smith at Massachusetts Audubon, who's been studying snowy owls at Logan Airport in Boston since 1981, longer than pretty much anybody else in in, uh, in the United States. And um, we also had uh, um, Andy's boss, Mike Lanzone, the the president of Cellular Tracking Technologies who's a golden eagle biologist, but got his start in Rochester, New York, trapping and banding snowy owls as a, as a teenager. And within a day or two, we had a proposal that we sent off to the Federal Bird Banding Laboratory asking for permission to deploy GPS GSM transmitters on snowy owls to, to, to study their winter movement ecology. Ironically, at that time, we knew less about the ecology and movements of snowy owls in the winter when they're down here in the South with us than we do about their life up in the remote parts of the Arctic. Well, we submitted this to the bird banding laboratory. Don't let anybody tell you the, the federal government can't move um, with speed and alacrity. They, they approved our a proposal in less than an hour because they'd already been thinking along the same lines and were actually hoping somebody would come to them with an idea to do this kind of project. And so Project Snowstorm was born. And the capital S-N-O-W is not just a graphic affectation that, as many birders will recognize, is the four letter banding code for snowy owl, SN from snowy, OW from owl. So that's, that's where Project Snowstorm got its name. So in the 10 years since then, Project Snowstorm has been, um, has grown into arguably the largest snowy owl research project in, in the world, certainly one of the largest snowy owl research projects in the world. We've used these G GPS GSM transmitters, and I'll talk a little bit more about how they work in a minute. Um, we've deployed them on 110 snowy owls in 17 states and provinces, primarily from the Great Plains through the Great Lakes, through Southern Canada, New England, and down through the Mid-Atlantic. Although we've done a little bit of work with colleagues like Denver, um, Denver Holt and the Owl Research Institute up in, up in Canada, and we've deployed some transmitters up on the breeding grounds in Nunavut on young, on young owls. Um, since we're going to the trouble of catching these birds anyway, we want to get as much information from them as possible. So we collect blood, feather, and DNA samples from the snowy owls that we catch. Um, that allows us to look at the genetic structure of North America's snowy owl population. We can look at stable chemical isotopes in their feathers, in their blood, in their tissue that can tell us, for example, how their diet changes over time. And it also gives us an, an opportunity to look at what kind of environmental toxins these birds are picking up. And we realized very quickly at the beginning of Project Snowstorm 10 years ago that we had a real opportunity to work with a team, a, ter a terrific team of wildlife veterinarians and pathologists, um, because unfortunately, snowy owls get in trouble when they come south, and a lot of them end up dead and injured. They wind up hit by cars, hit by planes, electrocuted. They die from rodenticide poisoning. They're brought into wildlife rehab centers. Sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. And so you have these, these dead snowy owls that themselves are a resource that allow us to learn much more about the health and particularly the um, environmental contaminant um, envir uh, uh, in landscape in which, in which these birds live. So at the moment, um, Project Snowstorm is, has a core team of about two dozen researchers, volunteer banders, and, uh, and veterinarians. Pretty much everybody that you see here is a volunteer. Um, nobody gets any kind of a stipend. Nobody gets any kind of um, a salary through Project Snowstorm. Everybody volunteers their time. Some folks are able to do this through their, their job. They may work for a, a state or federal resource agency or an organization or nonprofit that does this kind of work. But for the most part, um, even so, the time they put into Project Snowstorm is almost always a, a, as a volunteer, which is good because... When we launched this thing, we didn't have a budget. Um, you know, usually when you start a new scientific project, the first thing you do is figure out where your money's gonna come from. And you often spend 
months or sometimes years trying to find funders and sending proposals to foundations and getting rejected and revising them and sending to somebody else until you finally get the money you need. We launched this by the seat of our pants. We had a couple of private donors that put up the money that we needed for that first half dozen or so transmitters, which even at cost were about $3,000 a piece. And we weren't sure we were, where we were going to get more money to keep this going. And, and Dave Brinker, who is an outside, thinking outside the box kind of guy, said, hey, listen, why don't we try crowdfunding? And I said, wait a minute. So what you think we should do is ask strangers to give us money to play with owls, because that's what it's going to sound like to people. I said, yeah, we should try that. And so we did. We launched a, a crowdfunding campaign on the um, Indiegogo crowdfunding platform, and it took off like a bottle rocket. Uh, we set a $20,000 goal that first winter. Um, we ended up raising more than $36,000 in small tax-deductible um, contributions from people around the world. All the money went through our home institution, the Ned Smith Center for Nature and Art in Pennsylvania, which I mentioned earlier, which is a 501c3 um, nonprofit. So um, folks were able to donate to us and get a tax advantage for it. Uh, that same winter, we also received a roughly equal amount of money from um, organizations like uh, the Pennsylvania Society for Ornithology, the Delmarva um, Ornithological Society, the Wisconsin Natural Heritage Foundation, groups that for the most part were sponsoring one or more transmitters to, to be deployed on owls in their, in their um, local area. And so that first winter, we were able to tag 22 snowy owls in, I, I want to say, seven states that first year, um, which was incredible. It was far more than we thought we were ever going to be able to do. So the transmitters that we're using, this is kind of a heart and soul of what we do at Project Snowstorm. They've undergone a lot of changes. Um, this has been a fairly steep learning curve, I have to say. Um, for example, when we launched this project, um, we, we knew that this, this notion people have that snowy owls are primarily diurnal is not true. In the wintertime, when it gets dark, snowy owls are mostly active after dark. Um, in the summertime in the Arctic, the sun doesn't set, they, they have no choice but to be diurnal. But in the winter, they're, they're mostly active at night, but they roost out in the open. And we thought this is a perfect application for solar powered technology because the bird's going to be sitting out there sitting in the sunshine all day which is true, except that we found that many snowy owls are like little sunflowers. They face the sun, and as the sun moves across the sky, they keep moving with it, and so their back is always in shade. So we, they also have extremely thick plumage. We had to make our transmitters very tall, so the solar panel, which was larger than it might otherwise have to be, um, because it's often in shade, you know, we, there were a lot of... Um, there were a lot of tweaks over the first couple of years before we finally figured this all out. The guts of these things, though, are using two technologies that most of you probably have in your pocket right now. They communicate with the GPS satellite system overhead, so they record um, latitude, longitude, altitude, and flight speed as frequently as every six seconds, and then store that information in an onboard memory bank, and then two or three times a week, they dial up through a cell phone modem and connect with the cell phone network and send all of that data to us, all of those GPS points to us over the cell phone network. And when that happens, I get a little ping on my cell phone that tells me that a snowy owl has checked in, thus proving that my friends are cooler than your friends because I get text messages from snowy owls. Of course, you have to catch a snowy owl first, and that can be a real challenge. Um, the young birds on their first migration, um, as, as many birders know, can be remarkably approachable. Um, they've never seen people before. Hell, they've never seen trees before. And so it's all kind of new to them. Older birds, adult birds, which is what we preferentially prefer to, to, um, to trap and tag because they've had their passport stamped a couple of times. They're not likely to make dumb mistakes. They're, they're probably going to you know survive year after year after year. Um, but we use a couple of techniques. Um, sometimes we use big spring-loaded bow nets like this one that I'm schlepping down the beach um, in, uh, in New Jersey. Um, sometimes we will use noose traps, which basically just have large monofilament nooses surrounding a cage that has um, perhaps a couple of Russian hamsters in it, these cold hardy Russian hamsters. And when the owl swoops in to try to grab um, the, cage, the caged um, uh, uh, lure animal, the noose connects 
you know, over their, over their legs, it's attached to the traps attached to a long bungee cord and a lightweight drag weight. And it just gently brings the owl down to the ground. Um, it's a very proven safe uh, way of catching these, these big, powerful birds. Once we've got them in hand, um, we take all the normal measurements that any bird bander would. Uh, we age and sex the bird based on um, its plumage pattern, and replacement um, pattern of feathers in the wing. We put a USGS leg band on the bird, and then we fit it with one of these um, well, roughly 45 gram transmitters. And it goes on with a little backpack harness, um, this uh, uh, synthetic material called Spectra that we use for the harness. It's down under the feathers next to the bird's skin. We settle that transmitter right in the middle of the bird's back at the center of its point of gravity. And all of the bits and pieces together, the, the, the transmitter, the harness, the band that we put on the leg, all of that together weighs less than 3% of the bird's body weight, which um, research has shown over the years is, seems to be a safe threshold for putting any kind of transmitter on a wild bird. And then we let the bird go back where it was, where it was trapped for the most part. And, um, and then we're able to start to follow these birds on their, on their journeys. And pretty much every single bird that we've ever put a transmitter on has surprised us in some way, starting with the very first one. It was a bird that we caught in December of 2013 on Assateague Island on the coast of Maryland. It was a, a juvenile male. And we figured if anything, he would either spend the winter on Assateague or keep moving south because that winter, well, there were snowy owls as far south as Jacksonville, Florida. But one of them actually made it out to Bermuda that, that winter. But instead, he moved north and then east and spent the rest of the winter on the coast of New Jersey and surprised us because when we started getting his data like this, we realized this bird was not doing any hunting over land. Now, this is a snowy owl, and everybody knows that snowy owls eat small furry animals like lemmings. There's not a lot of small furry animals out in the middle of the Delaware Bay, but that's where this bird, we nicknamed him Assateague because we... We tend to name our birds for the, the, the location at which they were trapped. Um, Assateague was doing all of his hunting at night out over the open water of Delaware Bay. He wasn't hunting small mammals. He was hunting water birds, picking off ducks and grebes and gulls out there. Um, now, we've also had many birds that have wintered in coastal environments like this that do all of their hunting over land, hunting for rice rats and voles and, and cottontail rabbits. So um, one of the things that we have found with all of these snowy owls is that they are very individualistic. And they do things, we, we get the data sometimes and you have to kind of scratch your head. Um, this is that same bird, this is Assateague. Um, he'd moved uh, a bit farther north up to Barnegat Bay. And that, oh, I should also say with, with this particular style of map that you're looking at, anything in blue um, are locations or movements at night, anything in red are locations or movements in the daytime. So you can see that they really are um, primarily a nocturnal bird at this time of the year. You know, during the day, it's mostly mostly just hanging out on these little offshore islands and mud bars, just kind of keeping his head down. Um, later in the winter, Barnegat Bay froze over completely. But early in the season, it was still open water, which makes that big blue blob in the middle there kind of surprising because snowy owls don't float. And I could not, for the life of me, imagine what this bird was doing out there over and over again in the middle of open water until I zoomed in far enough on Google Earth to realize there's actually a channel marker. There's a buoy under there. And what he was doing was flying out from land, you know, landing there on this, you know, bobbing back and forth in this buoy and going, all right, let's see, I had a buffle head last night. I think I'm going to have a scalp tonight. When I say these birds are individualistic, it also plays out in, in their movement patterns. Um, some of them are real homebodies. Some of them have a bad case of wanderlust. This is another juvenile male that we caught on the, on the coast of, uh, of Maryland in Assateague Island. Um, put, a, put a transmitter on him, released him, and he flew up through the Delmarva Peninsula and across the Delaware River at Wilmington, skirted Philadelphia, swung over through um, southeastern Pennsylvania, spent a couple of weeks in Amish country in Lancaster County, which is great habitat for snowy owls, but for whatever reason, he left and flew back down to the coast of New Jersey and spent the rest of the winter down by Cape May Courthouse. On the other hand, these are the territories of two adult female snowy owls in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan a couple of years later. Each of those territories is about a quarter of a mile wide. They didn't budge all winter long, and they also did not trespass on each other. In fact, the red bird only went through the yellow bird's territory after the yellow bird left 
um, on her on her migration north in the spring. But you know, if your if your neighbor weighs six and a half pounds and has eight powerful needle sharp knives at the end of her feet, maybe you don't trespass. We found that movement patterns, whether they stay in one place or, or move widely, don't seem to be connected to age or sex. Um, it really does seem to be an individualistic pattern. It's also been fascinating to watch um, how um, the movements of these birds change over time. It gives us an opportunity to follow the same birds year after year after year. This is a young male snowy owl that was caught that first winter, 2013, 2014, at a small airport outside of Baltimore. And um, because male snowy owls, like most male raptors, are smaller than the females, we actually have two different size transmitters, a, a slightly larger size for females, a slightly smaller size for males, because again, we want to keep it under that 3% um, limit. And we didn't have a transmitter that was the right size for this male. So we banded him, and he was moved about 50 miles west into the farmland of, uh, of Maryland to get him away from that the airports, which, um, as we'll talk about in a bit, are very dangerous places for snowy owls. And the next winter, he came back to the same airport where he was trapped a second time. And this time, we had a transmitter, the right size for him. So we fitted him with a transmitter, moved him down to the coast at Assateague Island, and released him down there. And we were able to follow him for the rest of the winter. Um, he also moved north, which was interesting, crossed the Delaware Bay, moved up the coast of, uh, of New Jersey, and spent the winter around Great Egg Harbor. Um, we nicknamed him Baltimore. His transmitter was, was uh, sponsored by the Baltimore Bird Club. And he was kind of a surf and turf guy. He would, would hunt equally over open water in the bay and on, on land for mammals. Um, didn't, didn't seem to matter to him too much. And then in the springtime, he started to head north. And as you can see, um, he went up through New York City. And I mean, he went through the middle of New York City, right up the middle of Manhattan. At two o'clock in the morning, he was roosting on top of a 58-story skyscraper next to Madison Square Garden. Um, this is the view he had from up there. I don't think he liked it because he kept moving on pretty pretty hurriedly back up to uh, Lake Ontario and then farther on up into the uh, the subarctic where he spent the rest of the summer. And then we followed that bird for the next three years, I believe. He never came that far south again. In fact, thereafter, he either wintered on Amherst Island in Lake Ontario and then for the, the subsequent number of years in the Ottawa River Valley. And at one point, um, his transmitter finally gave out. And we spent two winters, because we knew basically where he came now every winter, trying to retrap him. And eventually we were able to, to retrap him and take that failed transmitter off. Unfortunately, we did not have permission from Ontario's Ministry of the Environment to put a new transmitter on him, but we figured he'd already done his bit for science. So all of the information we have about all of these owls, including all the tracking data for all 110 snowy owls that we've put transmitters on, is available on our website. If you go to www.projectsnowstorm.org, you can find um, all of the information on there about what our snowy owls are up to. You can sign up for um, our email blast every time we post a new blog, um, blog update about what we're up to. You'll get a little ping in your email box telling you about it. All of the owls, there's bios of all of the owls, and also interactive maps showing where these owls have gone. Um, these, this is the map showing the travels of um, a, a bird that we're still tracking today. It's a, an adult male that was trapped um, in upstate New York, New York, up uh, up in Cape Vincent. Um, we call him Otter, and um, Otter, Otter, you can see is doing what snowy owls do, which is coming back year after year to pretty much the same place every winter. They show a lot of fidelity to the same general wintering area. In his case upstate New York, southern Ontario, occasionally over toward Montreal and the St. Lawrence Valley, but during the summer traveling thousands of, of kilometers in different directions. Snow owls are highly nomadic during the summer breeding season, probably because they're looking for these, these peaks in lemming populations. So some years, um, you know, otter is up in the northern Ongava Peninsula or over in, in uh, on Baffin Island. Um, going up the east side of Hudson Bay. Other years, he swings around on the west side, way up into the um, central Canadian Arctic, up around the Melville Peninsula, places like that. Um, and if you're interested in finding out where he's where he goes, you know, you can you can find him and all of our other owls on the website, and you can zoom in at um, really extraordinary levels of detail on these maps. Um, all of these little icons, the the colors will tell you whether that location was at night or during the day or at twilight. 
and they're all clickable. So you can, you know, you can look at, you know, completely geek out and, and nerd out on like what his heading and his um, speed and knots and miles per hour was as he was, as he was traveling. Um, it's, it's, it's a ton of fun. The one thing we won't tell you is where the owl is right now. Um, all of our locations are time delayed by about 24 hours because we don't want to tell people who might not want to be particularly kind to snowy owls where they can find snowy owls. We've, we fortunately have never really had a problem with that, but sometimes birders and photographers, even, even though they don't mean to, can be a little overly enthusiastic. Sometimes we get data that makes us scratch our heads. And this was one of those cases. This is one of the first owls that we tagged that initial winter. Uh, it was a juvenile male that was tagged in Erie, Pennsylvania. And that was a winter, that was the winter of the polar vortex. That was the first time most of us heard the term polar vortex. And Lake Erie froze almost completely solid. It was like 98.5% frozen that winter. And this owl and another juvenile male moved out onto the ice and spent weeks out there. Now, what you're looking at here is a map um, on Google Earth that's kind of the raw data that we get in from the transmitters. This is how we, we get the, the data before we've done any processing with it. And all those little square icons are stationary locations for snowy owl. And they're at half hour intervals. So basically what you see here is a bird that's moving at about an eighth of a mile an hour. And when I first looked at this, I thought, oh my God, he's walking to Canada. And then when we thought about it a little bit more and looked at satellite images of the lake, we realized, no, this is what happens when you have a stationary owl sitting on an enormous slab of ice that is being very slowly pushed by prevailing southwest winds to the northeast. Um, and But th this owl and the other male owl spent, as I said, weeks out on the ice. And we had to wonder, what on earth are they eating out there? They can't, you know... They're snowy owls, but they don't eat snow. But when we looked at the satellite images that are posted every day um, on by NOAA, we realized that as these winds are moving these big plates of ice around, they're also opening up leads in the in in the ice, open areas of open water between these ice plates. And we know from shore observations that in those openings are ducks and gulls and grebes and loons and other water birds. And that's what these young owls were feeding on. And in a, in a way, they may actually be practicing a lifestyle that as an adult, they will follow in a much more challenging environment. Because we know from satellite studies that some of our colleagues in Canada have done, that some adult snowy owls actually, instead of coming south for the winter, actually move north out onto the Arctic sea ice, where they find permanent openings in the ice called pollinias in which winter large numbers of sea ducks like eiders and, um, and seabirds like, like murres. And so these adult owls in the perpetual darkness of the Arctic winter are sitting up there next to these pollinias feeding on these seabirds. And in a way, these young owls might have been practicing for that. We also had owls that wintered in the most densely inhabited urban areas that you can imagine. This was a, a, a juvenile female snowy owl that was trapped at that same small state airport outside of Baltimore. We put a transmitter on her and we moved her 50 miles west into the farmland of Western Maryland and she flew right back to the city and spent the rest of the winter floating around downtown Baltimore, out over the, the inner harbor, um, and it was kind of fun because you could use the Google Street View feature and kind of get a street level view of where this bird was. This was one of her favorite roosting sites on the on the roof of this church. Um, we were pretty worried about her um, in this urban area, wondering what on earth she was eating. We were, you know, probably eating rats and pigeons. And I would not have wanted to be a feral cat in that neighborhood, perhaps, because that's not out of the question for snowy owl to take a cat, um, but I was really more concerned about her picking up rat poison or poison pigeon or something like that. But she made it through the winter. She made it through the winter just fine. But you know, when these owls come south, they do can, they do get in trouble sometimes. Um, I mentioned our good friend Norman Smith earlier from Mass Audubon. Um, that first couple of winters, um, Norman put transmitters on, on a fair number of owls that he moved from Logan Airport. That first, that big winter of 2013, 2014, Norman moved 153 snowy owls off the tarmac at Logan Airport and relocated them to northern Massachusetts or down to Cape Cod to get them away from the dangers of the airfield. And what he's re releasing here is a, a juvenile female that he nicknamed Sandy Neck because that's the, uh, the beach where he released the bird. 
Um, she had very good taste. She moved out and spent the winter on Martha's Vineyard, um, rather tony place to spend the winter. And you can see she was spending her time mostly around the, uh, the harbor there at the northeastern end of the island. But in March of 2014, a huge nor'easter came boiling up the coast, much like the storm we had um, here in New England just a couple of days ago that really battered the seacoast. And looking at her data just before daybreak at the peak of the storm with 70 or 80 mile an hour hurricane force winds and 25 to 30 foot seas, she tried to fly across the open water of the bay. And she didn't make it. Um, she was found a day or two later washed up on the beach. Another one of um, our tagged birds in Gloucester Harbor and uh, up in uh, northern Massachusetts also drowned during that same storm, as did four or five other unbanded, untagged snowy owls that were found washed up on beaches um, in the wake of that storm. All of these were young birds. And I suspect that an older, more experienced adult would have known enough to just kind of hunker down in that storm and try to ride it out. Um, but young birds make, make bad decisions sometimes. But frankly, the biggest danger for snowy owls when they come south is us. Um, snowy owls get into all kinds of trouble when they come into inhabited landscapes because they're coming from one of the re most remote parts of North America where not only have they never seen a person, as I said before, they've never seen a tree. All of this is equally new to them. Uh, the young birds in particular can be quite naive around people. And they also are attracted to places that look a little bit like home. So they're coming from a treeless Arctic environment and moving south into either urban landscapes or in many cases, very heavily forested landscapes. And one of the places that looks more or less like home because it's wide open and there's no trees are airports. And so snowy owls have this unfortunate habit of gravitating toward airports which is very dangerous for snowy owls. Lots and lots of snowy owls are killed um, either by direct collisions with planes or, or killed by jet blasts as the, as the taxiing airplane turns. And so we realized early on that we had an opportunity with Project Snowstorm to help the airport authorities that are spending a lot of time, often a lot of time and money and, um, and labor to try to trap and relocate these birds, help them better understand what techniques for moving these owls away from airports are most effective for making sure that the birds don't come back to the airports. And so from the very beginning with Project Snowstorm, we've been working with airport authorities in the US and Canada um, to, to tag the owls that for the most part, um, contractors or government agents are, are trapping. So for example, this is Jenny Martin, who at the time was the wildlife services um, biologist at Philadelphia International Airport with um, a juvenile male snowy owl that we nicknamed Philly that I trapped with, uh, with Jenny's help out on active runways at Philadelphia airport. It was a workaday thing for her, but it's the first time I've ever been sitting there like 30 yards away from an, air, from an airstrip where one 737 after another is slapping down every 10 minutes or so with a tremendous amount of noise. Doesn't bother the owls in the slightest, but we got this bird. We fitted him with a transmitter uh, with the help of the Pennsylvania Game Commission. We relocated him far to the west in Amish country in Lancaster County, which, as I said, is great habitat for snowy owls. And he went right back to the airport in two days. Um, and we, Jenny and I spent the next three weeks or so repeatedly trying to trap this bird. But there was a little bit of fool me twice shame on me um, by that point. And we never did catch him, which was unfortunate because one morning just at daybreak, he flew across a runway just as a cargo jet was taking off and was struck and killed. Now, fortunately, it did not bring down the airplane because, you know, bird strikes are a serious hazard um, to air traffic. And, you know, nothing will spoil your day sitting back there in row 36 um, in, in the airplane if a six pound snowy owl comes through the windscreen um, of the plane and hits your pilot in the face. So we're, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to make it um, so that this doesn't happen. And in fact, over the course of the last 10 years, we've tagged 42 snowy owls that have been relocated from 13 airports in the US and Canada and studied the, the reactions of these birds. So we, you know, trying different distances, different habitats in which these birds are being released, um, whether it's whether holding the bird for 24 or 48 hours, feeding it so it's so it's nice and healthy, and then releasing if that re if that reduces the chances of the birds coming back, it seems to. 
And so two years ago, we, we analyzed um, all of our results and published a paper in the Journal of, of Wildlife um, the, the Journal of Wildlife Management to try to get the word out to um, to other other airport authorities um, on on sort of best practices for moving snowy owls um, away from from their airports and, and and keeping them safe and that's something we're continuing to work on but as I said unfortunately some snowy owls don't make it and one of the most important um, although somewhat um, less publicized aspects of what we do with Project Snowstorm is work with our terrific team of wildlife veterinarians. To, to kind of mine the information that these accidentally killed snowy owls can provide to us. And so we have this terrific team. That's Dr. Cindy Driscoll on the left. She's the state wildlife veterinarian for uh, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Dr. Cheryl Davison from the University of Pennsylvania's New Bolton Center in southeastern Pennsylvania. And Dr. Erica Miller, who is also at University of Pennsylvania and heads up um, the uh, the Wildlife Futures Program in Pennsylvania, which is a, a collaboration studying emerging wildlife diseases. And they volunteer their time for Project Snowstorm over the course of the, um, the years, working with state and federal and provincial agencies. We've salvaged something like 206 snowy owls that had been hit by cars or planes or found dead or electrocuted or came into rehab centers and had to be euthanized. And so these folks... Um, at the end of the at the end of the winter, after they've, after we've um, uh, you know sort of stockpiled that winter's dead snowy owls, they they have a little necropsy palooza. Um, it's um, not necessarily any might not be our cup of tea, but um, this is this is what these highly trained professionals do. Um, and what they're doing is they're, they're they're trying to assess the health of the birds. They're they're taking samples to find out what what diseases might these birds have had. What parasites are they carrying? What environmental toxins are they picking up? So we're, we're testing um, the, the birds for organic um, chemicals like DDT and DDE and PCBs, for heavy metals like, like lead and mercury, um, for, um, uh, for rodenticide, which is a significant problem with, with, uh, with many birds of prey. And in fact, almost every snowy owl we've ever tested has at least trace amounts of, of rodenticide in its, in its system. One of the things that we have found that surprised us, however, is the degree to which snowy owls carry, in some cases, frighteningly large loads of methyl mercury. Um, mercury is an air pollutant. It's, it's generated by coal-fired power plants, by automobile exhausts. It precipitates out of the atmosphere, gets into aquatic food chains, and then it bioaccumulates at each step up the food chain. So eventually, top-order predators like snowy owls that may be feeding um, very heavily on Fish eating birds like like ducks and gulls, they can they can um, pick up a really heavy load of mercury. And mercury at high enough levels can cause reproduction problems. It can also cause behavioral problems. If you've ever heard the term mad as a hatter, that refers to hat makers in the 19th century that used mercury to make felt hats and they'd absorb it through their skin and uh, they would appear to go crazy. Um, it, it caused severe mental issues. And we, we've started to wonder if maybe some of these owls that are carrying large loads of mercury that get hit by cars or planes or fly into buildings or strike electrical lines, if they're suffering a degree of cognitive impairment impairment from the, from the mercury. That's one of the things that we're going to continue to, work, to look at. I should also say that after the necropsy, all of these snowy owl specimens then go to the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia and are prepared as, as museum specimen skins, um, uh, tissue samples are, are preserved there. We, we try to make all the use that we possibly can from these, from these birds. Um, and we're also, we're at the moment, we I say we've necropsied about 200 of these birds ourselves. Colleagues of ours around the US and Canada have a data set of roughly another 200 snowy owls that have been necropsied and tested in other facilities that they've made available to us. And we are now in the process of doing a really massive analysis um, on, on, the, on the health, mortality, and environmental toxicology of snowy owls, which we expect to be publishing in a peer-reviewed journal later this year. One of, at this point, um, I think we've got probably 10 or 12 peer-reviewed papers on snowy owl biology and movement ecology that we've, uh, that we've been doing. So these birds start to move north in the spring. Um, and by the way, all of those papers are available on our website. Take a look at that. Um, all of these birds start moving north in um, March and April. The adults head north first 
because they've got business up in the north. The juveniles, they probably don't come into breeding condition until they're two to four years old, so they tend to lollygag a little bit more. Once these birds move out of the cell phone network, we lose track of them because these transmitters communicate to us through the cell network. And as you can see from this map, the cell network is very dense in southern Ontario and not so dense anywhere else in Canada. So we tend to lose them, but the transmitters continue to um, uh, record latitude, longitude, all of those, all those GPS points the whole time they're up in the north. In fact, we've had some birds that have remained in the north for more than one year. But when they come back south again, when they come down into, um, uh, into cell territory, they hit a cell tower, um, it, it connects, we get like you know, 14,000 GPS points that come pouring through. Um, it's, it's, it's really fun then to see where these birds have gone. And even though our primary interest is in the winter movement ecology of snowy owls, the cherry on the Sunday for us is all the information we get about their migration route and their breeding up in the north. We've got at this point, a really robust data set at a very granular level on the on the breeding movement ecology of snowy owls. And we haven't analyzed that yet, but that's going to be one of our projects down the road. When you put all of those movements together, this is what it looks like. That's what about three quarters of a million GPS points look like for all of the snowy owls that we've tagged over the years. And you can see some interesting patterns there. Um, you can see that the uh, the birds have a tendency to take that shortest route from, say, the eastern Great Lakes and, and St. Lawrence Valley up to James Bay and Hudson Bay. Um, a lot of our birds spend a lot of time in the Ungava Peninsula where they're, um, uh, you know, where, where many of these birds are breeding. Um, some of them will actually go right across the middle of Hudson Bay because at that time of the year in late April and May, it's still pretty much frozen. Others will take a big wide swing to the west um, out into the Great Plains and then up through, you know, Manitoba and Saskatchewan and up the west side of Hudson Bay. The one place, as you see, that they do not usually go is that enormous area of boreal forest in western Ontario. And the reason for that, I suspect, is because snowy owls are open country birds and the boreal forest is a, is a hostile alien environment for them. And I, I don't I use the word hostile advisedly because sometimes when they enter the boreal forest, they don't come out again. If you notice, there's a couple of pink tracks that enter that big blob of forest and then just stop dead. We don't know what happened to those birds. Um, those are very remote areas. It's, we've, we've never been able to get somebody to get in there and, uh, and locate the carcass quickly enough for us to be able to tell what happened to us, um, what happened to it. I suspect that it's predation, and it would not entirely surprise me if it's bald eagles and possibly even great horned owls. Great horned owls are a little bit smaller on average than snowy owls, but the boreal forest is the great horned owl's backyard, and a snowy owl down in those trees, I think, would be at significant risk. I want to leave you here with one last track, um, just, to sh just, just for fun and just to show you what has us scratching our heads sometimes. So this is one of those birds that wintered that first winter um, out on the ice on Lake Erie. Um, come springtime, he moved north up um, onto, uh, to and out onto Hudson Bay where he did that. And I can tell you that this puzzled the bejesus out of us when we first saw it, trying to figure this out. And it took a couple of days before the penny finally dropped. And I'm, I'm hoping everybody can see my cursor here. But um, if you look down at the bottom there, this is what happens when you have a, a, an owl riding on an iceberg. So he landed in the iceberg. And when the wind and the tide were in the same direction, it kind of went in this big loop to the west. And then the tide turned against the wind. It didn't go quite so far. And then the wind and the tide were in the same direction and it went way to the west. And then not so far. And then the wind shifted from the south and the wind shifted from the north. And at that point, the owl said the heck with it and flew back to land. We would love to have you come along for the ride. Um, as I say, you know, everything that we do at Project Snowstorm, because we continue to be 100% funded by small donations from the general public through a, an annual crowdfunding campaign. We've, we've got a crowdfunding campaign that's going on right now. All the tracking data is on there. Um, we make our tracking data available. For example, we have helped a whole bunch of middle school and high school students with uh, with science fair projects. Um, you know, if you if you if you if you or a student you know would like to work with real snowy owl tracking data, we're happy to provide that for you. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a blast, and um, 
we it, it has been i have to tell you though a very slow winter this year um for the first time since we started this project none of our tagged snowy owls have come back south into into um uh, into cell range and we're not exactly sure what's going on we suspect there may be two things at play here i'm going to stop sh stop screen sharing here and just come back um we think there's probably there, there could be two things going on um as many of you know there's a there's a we have a real epidemic in north america right now with highly pathogenic avian influenza hpai and we know that snowy owls have been affected and we suspect that a number of our tagged owls um, two winters ago succumbed to highly pathogenic avian influenza so that may be part of the issue um, last winter we had three returned owls as opposed to our usual nine to ten we then tagged an additional three owls last winter but it's also been an unusually warm winter um, across much of the, uh, the the arctic and subarctic and my suspicion is that those owls are just still up there Otter, the bird that I showed you before, showed you the, the map all over. He's got a hybrid transmitter that communicates um, during part of the year through the satellite system. And we know that he was doing just fine through the middle of fall when he was still pretty far up in the Arctic. So maybe if we get some real cold weather here in January, um, we'll get some of these owls south again. Um, but sign up for our email blast and we will let you know the moment one of them comes down south again. So anyway, I'm going to stop talking for a minute here. I'm going to take a drink of water and turn things back over to Derek. So we're going to do our very best to get to these questions. So one of these, Scott, is um, we have a preschool teacher in Vermont um, that's really interested in trying to figure out ways to connect with her kids um, and, and, and introducing the magic of owls. Do you have any experience with that, Scott, um, or any suggestions for this person? Sure. Depending on where, where they are in Vermont, uh, the Vermont Institute of Natural Science, VINS, has um, a huge captive raptor collection, including a lot of owls. But VINS is a really good um, in-state resource for, for raptor conservation or raptor education. And um, I'd be happy to reach out to that person and put them in touch with VINS. But you can you can find VINS, Vermont Institute of Natural Sciences. You can find them easily on um, online. And, and I, they, they're terrific people to work with. Thank you, Scott. That's a great, great um, connection you just made there. Um, this one's about lemmings. It's kind of a two-part question here. Um, that pile of lemmings you shared, um, mm -hmm. this person was wondering, um, will they eat the lemmings even if they've been sitting around for a while? Do they have to be fresh? And do those lemmings attract predators like foxes while they're just sort of laying in that pile? God help a fox that gets too close to a snowy owl nest. It's funny because snowy owls are, are pretty, for the most part, pretty mellow when they're down here but they are ferociously defensive near their nests. And an Arctic fox, even a wolf, getting close to a, a snowy owl nest is, is, gonna, is gonna get the unilot kicked out of it. In fact, I've, I've talked to scientists who have watched snowy owls put a polar bear to flight. And I mean, that, that is a badass bird if it can chase a polar bear away. Um, and it's, you know, it's the Arctic, it's cold, even in the summertime, it's cold. Um, but frankly, when the lemming numbers are that high, they don't they probably don't have to dip into that um that's that kind of free hatching store in fact one of my one of my favorite stories and i don't want to take too much time here because I, I know we only have a couple of minutes left but um the only case of a male snowy owl that was known to have two mates that it was provisioning two nests so you have one male feeding two females and if i remember correctly a total of 16 chicks and there were so many lemmings that he was able to sleep 19 hours a day. When, wow. when you get these lemming booms, there's just so much food. They just, it's, it's really not hard for them to do it. Now, the thing is, when you don't have a lemming boom like that, the owls generally do not breed or do not breed successfully. And in fact, there seems to be some indication that maybe even, even if they're able to bring off chicks and the chicks fledge, there may not be enough food for the chicks to survive to, to full independence. Now, That's one of the things that we're hoping to study is the um, the annual the, the survival rate and mortality rate and dispersal of young snowy owls. We were we were all set to do that in the summer of 2020 up on Bylot Island in the Canadian Arctic, and then the pandemic hit and we couldn't travel up to the north, and we just haven't had good breeding conditions up there ever since. Now, Scott, um, 
I guess we have time for this one last question, which is okay. related to this. Do we have any idea what causes these explosions in these lemming populations? Yeah. Well, and, and that's not that's not unusual for small mammals. A lot of small mammal populations are are somewhat cyclical. They're somewhat periodic. Um, you know, we see that with with um, like deer mouse and, and white footed mouse populations in in the lower 48 meadow voles will often cycle over the course of four years. There's a great book that was written back in the 19 early 1980s by the, the legendary biologist Ron Hammerstrom about her studies of harriers in Wisconsin looking at how harrier populations rose and fell on this four-year cycle with the meadow voles. And her, her book is called Harrier Hawk of the Marsh, The Hawk That Is Ruled by a Mouse. And we, we which is an interesting thing because we tend to think about predators controlling their prey. Uh -uh. The prey controls the predators. And that's very much the case with snowy owls. Interesting. Well, thank you very much. Um, Scott, I think I speak for everyone in attendance tonight, but I mean, gosh, we're hugely thankful to you and the folks at Project Snowstorm for just leading this incredibly important research. And thank you so much for just sharing this wonderful work with all of us. It's, it's my pleasure. And I, yeah. again, I, I, I speak from the heart. I, I really um, I'm so impressed with what the Adirondack Land Trust has been doing. It's it's always a pleasure to do any kind of a, an event with you. And I look forward to doing more in the future. Thank you. And, and really a big thanks to all the folks who generously carved out time to join us tonight. Um, and if you've enjoyed this program and would like to support land conservation in the Adirondacks, please click on the link in the chat to make a gift to the Adirondack Land Trust. And I do want to thanks, um, send thanks out again to the program sponsors, Birds and Beans and Black Rooster Maple. Please visit their websites and or locations and be sure to enjoy their incredible products. And finally, I just wanted to let folks know of another upcoming virtual program on February 22nd that you all may be interested in. Um, you could find that registration link on our website. The program features David Fadden from the Six Nations Iroquois Cultural Center and our very own conservation program director, Chris Jage. Um, the program will explore the Haudenosaunee relationship to the natural world through the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address and how that perspective can inform non-Native American ways of environmental conservation. So you'll hear how Dave and Chris are applying this perspective to conserve more than 300 acres of forest while providing a site for the cultural center's planned expansion and opening new pathways for collaborative conservation. So thank you all again. Please be on the look up, look out for a follow-up email, which will include a link to a survey. Um, we strive to share interesting and relevant content, and the survey will greatly assist us as we plan for future engaging programs. So again, have a great rest of the evening. Thank you again, and stop by the Keene office to all the folks that are tuned in from afar, and if you're ever visiting the Adirondacks, we'd love to see you.